the tendons and, and, and the glenoid uh, rim, um, you can increase that to 75% of contact and 50% uh, of depth um, of, uh, of the head of the humerus. So that becomes, so there's a tremendous difference between having a labrum and not having a labrum. Okay. Um, in the glenoid. Right. Um, and then, uh, and we'll come back to that later when we talk more about label disease. So, again, this is, this is a congenital variation where you have hypoplasia of the posterior glenoid, a retroverted glenoid, and a large posterior labrum, and at high risk for a tear, as we're seeing here. So, generally, defects in the posterior glenoid are congenital. Defects in the anterior glenoid are usually acquired from uh, uh, anterior dislocations. I think you asked me about uh, surgery for this. Uh, yeah. I suppose uh, maybe a, a bone block or, um, or doing an osteotomy of the neck of the um, glenoid might, might be helpful. Uh, these are tough conditions to deal with. Right. Um, yeah. So, and then, uh, and then the more, uh, this is more of a milder var variation here, but the, the more you lose that posterior bone, uh, the more at risk you are for posterior instability. So, but the, but these are probably um, more prevalent in um, grand mal seizure patients uh, yeah. with uh, epilepsy. Yeah, and then the, with grand mal seizures, you tend to get more of the posterior dislocations, and you can get kind of a reverse Hill Sachs injury right. to the to the glenoid. Right. Uh, see, uh, Max, what do you think of this case? So we got two axial sequences. One is T1 fat set, and the second one is a um, is that T2? Yeah, T2, or is it PD? This is a T2 and PD. PD. Okay. So we got. Uh, Actually, no, I think this is a arthrogram. This is a T1. Oh, and that's just joint fluid. Okay. So um, the humeral head is posteriorly positioned in relation to the glenoid, and the glenoid is atrophic and small in size, and. Um, that's about it. This is another patient. Another patient with severe congenital dysplasia and uh, a congenital posterior dislocation here. So here's the, the glenoid. It's very underdeveloped. The posterior rim is very blunted. And, uh, and we can see that the humeral head is chronically uh, dislocated. And we can see marked stretching of the, of the capsule posteriorly there. Just people have their arm in what position? during uh, just regular normal day because I mean that's not normal to have it to have your arm posteriorly the humor head so that means yeah. are they turned in well this patient was lying on their back in the scanner oh, okay. relatively relaxed so it's going to fall posteriorly mm -hmm. when they're up and about then it's all going to depend upon how they position it with their muscles but most likely most of the time it's going to be posterior dislocated and that's why you have such a, a expanded capsule posteriorly there uh, uh, the capsule, um, uh, for anybody that wants to know, is twice the size of the head of the humerus. Okay. Uh, let's see, Jeff, what do you think of this case? So I have two uh, radiographs of the shoulder. Uh, I believe they're the same size. They are the same size of the shoulder. Uh, let me say side of the body. And... Uh, it looks like we de we definitely have a uh, dislocation uh, of the uh, uh, you know, humor head, and uh, I'm trying to assess what you know. I mean, on these radiographs, I'm trying to assess whether or not to enter a posterior dislocation. I mean, it appears that the uh, I'm looking. I can see the posterior rim of the glenoid fossa. I believe it looks like it's intact. I'm I think this is an anterior dislocation. A lot of with some. Uh, pardon me, sir. Yeah, there's a lot of soft tissue calcification with some soft tissue thickening. That's on the plane fill. And this, this is another okay. congenital dysplasia. And this is actually a little bit posteriorly subluxed. Okay. Uh, let's see, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Uh, sure. So we've got a couple of uh, axial images of this uh, markedly uh, irregular appearing on. Shoulder. Uh, we're seeing a lot of joint fluid. Um, I'm not seeing very good development of the glenoid, so I think this is going to be a, a case of 
dysplasia. Right. We're seeing some so, so this, this is another severe dysplasia, and you can see a very abnormal configuration to the glenoid, and uh, and uh, a lot of effusion, a lot of capsular uh, distension here, and this is another congenital dysplasia and instability. Good. Uh, axial PD fat saturated image of the shoulder, and the glenoid and um, car articular cartilage of the glenoid, they look well developed on this case. Um, but there's, uh, so there's low signal intensity anterior to the glenoid um, between the subscapulars. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't see a discrete tear though um, with fluid, but there may be degenerative changes. So, so this is the PD fat set. So it looks like there's, there's yeah, but on the T1, there's actually it's the same uh, signal intensity as bone, so it looks like there's an osteophyte there with degenerative changes on the humeral head as well. So that's so what we have here really is an ossification of the anterior head of bone, and here we can see the ossification going out into the anterior and inferior labrum, some subchondral osteophytes here as well, and here's what the CT scan showed. So similar findings with yeah. the. Ossification. Is that because of a chronic tear? Yes. Or with yes. Chronic long standing degenerative disease and repetitive trauma. And some people are bone formers, are very good bone formers. And again, remember when you have an injury to soft tissues where they attach to the bone, they heal by the bone growing into the soft tissues because the soft tissue doesn't have any regenerative ability, but the bone does. So in this case, it's a chronic injury, and the bone just grows in to try to heal it, and you end up with an ossified labrum. And these are quite common in older individuals. And obviously not something you're going to want to go in and repair. Okay, so now let's look at uh, glenohumeral ligament, uh, labral and glenohumeral ligament tears. Uh, we'll kind of go all the way around and looking at different kinds of instability in, these, in, in the MR findings associated with it. We'll start with anterior instability, go to posterior, inferior, superior, multidirectional, and then sort of some of the complications that you can get into. So when we look at anterior dislocation, then we kind of look for Bankart lesions, Perthes lesions, Alpsa lesions, and GLAD lesions are uh, commonly described lesions to look for in the shoulder. So with anterior inst uh, instability, the mechanism of injury uh, is typically, you can see hill sex fracture, and you can also get a band cart lesion anteriorly. And the more these occur, the more likely you are to be unstable over time, to become more and more unstable. You get anterior labral lesions, and then there's some repair mechanisms we can look at. So the, the classic finding, really, of anterior dislocation is a humeral head uh, dislocates anteriorly, the muscles then reflexively uh, contract to try to bring it back into place and it can forcibly impact the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head against the anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid and that's produced the very characteristic hill sax impaction injury. By the time we see that on MR, almost always they'll be relocated again, uh, but not always as you'll see in a minute. Uh, this was... Uh, this hill sax lesion was actually initially described by Flowers in 1861, uh, but was uh, described in the journal Radiology in 1940, and a description that's kind of caught in the radiology literature by Hills and Sachs. So this is a 62-year-old male with traumatic anterior dislocation. Max, what do you think of this? Um, all right, so we have uh, humeral head is anterior and fairly dislocated. There is a... Uh, defect in the posterior, posterior or posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head consistent with the hill sacs deformity. It has well corticated uh, margins, so I think it's chronic. So this person actually uh, got his x-rays in the dislocated position, uh, which shows the, the pathophysiology that we just described. So here's the humeral head, there's the hill sacs lesion, and there's the anterior inferior glenoid uh, impacted into the hill sacs uh, defect. And this is what the CT scan looks like in a different patient. Here we can see the CT scan, the hill sacs lesion on the humeral head, 
and uh, the glenoid where it is impacted into the bone, uh, causing the mechanism of injury that we just talked about. This is the same patient, image one, they were dislocated in the MR scanner. This is the PD fat set image, again showing the impaction of the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head uh, by the glenoid. Uh, here's, an, here's another patient that shows, has chronic dislocation, and here we can see a dislocated humeral head. In this particular case, where there are also a lot of other uh, injuries around the shoulder. This is very chronic with a lot of thickening of the capsule. Uh, but uh, now, uh, w one thing that we'll talk about is if the hill sex lesion is large enough, then uh, with normal motion of the shoulder, the uh, hill sex lesion, uh, even without it being dislocated, uh, the posterior superior part of the glenoid can, uh, well, the, the humeral head can rotate around, so the hill sex impaction injury can actually uh, articulate with the posterior superior glenoid. When it, when it happens like that, that can produce a lot of symptoms. Uh, uh, when, when the hill sex lesion engages with the posterior superior part of the glenoid, that's called an engaging hill sex lesion. It's usually very small. We can see, see some of this on MR examination. Uh, if that occurs and is symptomatic, there's some plication techniques surgically where you can uh, tack the capsule down into the region of the house, hill sacs lesion, uh, which keeps the patient from engaging that, and it helps symptoms control. John, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, you, you use the capsule and also the infraspinatus tendon. Yeah. All you do is try to fill the gap so that it doesn't, uh, and, and, and if necessary, you use bone blocks. Okay. Uh, but with, with this uh, um, uh, image that you are showing, uh, it, 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 you, you, you probably. So, yeah, here we can see this grossly unstable in this particular case. Okay. Uh, Here's another patient who has an anterior dislocation, a very broad heel sac lesion, and here we can see in this more acute injury, we can see a displaced a fracture fragment. These are fairly uncommon, uh, but certainly needs to be described uh, when you see them. And this is post-reduction, where we can see the very large heel sac lesion. When they're this large, they're very likely to be engaging, and it may require if it's a younger individual, this is obviously an older individual with uh, severe osteoporosis, but in younger individuals, uh, this kind of lesion would be one that you might have to worry about having to do some sort of a uh, surgical plication or other lesion to help symptoms control. Well, that, this uh, has a piece of bone that's uh, uh, removed, and, and that's probably larger than it looks because of the cartilage that, that goes with it. Yes. So you can probably put it back into the defect and put a couple of screws in there or, or uh, sutures and suture it down. And uh, maybe that would, uh, uh, would help uh, in, in terms of, uh, especially since this is an older individual. And to get this kind of an injury, you have to have quite a bit of force. Yeah. And older individuals do not re-dislocate, only the younger ones do. Yep. Uh, and, and anybody over the age of 50, uh, and maybe the age of 40, uh, the dislocation rate or recurrence is about less than 10%. Yep. Uh, in uh, in uh, anybody in the age of 20 uh, or below, the re-dislocation re, uh, uh, the, is 50%. And in some cases, they say it's 90%, but uh, the literature is a little confused on that. And I think part of that risk in the young patients has to do with their bony anatomy. Uh, uh, those people who have congenital variants, like we talked about earlier, are at higher risk for recurrence than people who have and of, bony anatomy. And of course, the activity is far more uh, yep. significant than somebody older. Yeah, because they, they typically, especially anterior dislocations, typically occur in young patients and athletes, and they want to go back to do their athletic activity. So they repeat the same kind of forces 
uh, that caused the uh, dislocation to begin with, and so it's not a surprise that they would re-dislocate. Yeah, I've seen that on a football field. It's kind of interesting when you're doing that. Yeah. Not, a, not at all unusual, especially in defensive uh, players on the football field. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Don't tackle with your arms. <laughs> I'm not going to tackle, period. Uh, let's see. Who was last? Jeff, were you last? Uh, I don't remember, but I don't, remember. I don't think I was, but it's okay. Uh, Jonah, Jonah, why don't you take this one? I should have someone designated to keep track of who was last. Jonah? <laughs> yep, fair enough. Uh, so we've got these uh, two coronal uh, images of this patient's uh, shoulder. Uh, we're seeing a lot of edema and fluid signal around the humeral head, and we're not seeing it um, articulate with the uh, glenoid on the uh, other image. So um, I guess we've got... Uh, some sort of uh, dislocation here as well. Okay, so so here we have in this in the coronal plane. Here's the supraspinatus muscle. Here's the mm -hmm. tendon coming around, and it's attaching to something here. But there's no humeral head in the glenoid, right? Right. So it's uh, it's a vulse. Uh, this is a stir image that's a couple of centimeters more anterior. So what's happened here is that the the patient has an anterior dislocation. It's also rotated a little bit. And uh, here's the supraspinatus tendon attaching to the back of the, of the area we see here. And we see a lot of uh, bone edema and, and injury from this disloc dislocation. Here are what the axial images look like. Wow. Yeah, so uh, we see this uh, anterior and slightly rotated dislocation again. Uh, we see associated hill sacs uh, deformity. We see the uh, abnormality of uh, supraspinatus. Yeah. Uh, and notice here, you have the impaction injury of the humeral head, but you also see an injury to the glenoid. And you can just get trabecular bone injuries to the glenoid. You can get shearing and tears of the anterior labrum, very, very common. Or, as you all know, you can also get a frank fracture of the anterior inferior glenoid, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and get bone fragments from the uh, anterior inferior glenoid. And uh, some of these really require surgical treatment. Uh, this is probably a recurrence, uh, because otherwise uh, they wouldn't wait for an MRI. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. So we have uh, PD, fat sat, and GRE images, uh, axial images of the shoulder, and there's an impaction fracture with um, trabecular bone injury involving the posterior lateral humeral head. Um, so what causes infection fracture? So this is likely from an anterior dislocation, but it's been relocated. Yeah, so, so this, is, uh, this is what you'll typically see uh, frequently in, in individuals. It has a typical V-shaped appearance. Now, there are three, three injuries which occur in this exact same location. The most common one that we basically see in almost everybody, especially over the age of 30, are traction injuries of the infraspinatus insertion. It's a, really, this is the junction where the infraspinatus and supraspinatus tendons overlap, and they both attach in this location, and it's common to get chronic traction injuries here. And you, you've all seen those every time you've looked at a shoulder. So they're really common. You've got to differentiate that from a hill sacs lesion with an anterior dislocation. And typically, one is you don't get this more diffuse uh, bone marrow edema with indistinct margins uh, in the traction injuries. And the traction injuries usually get cystic changes, fairly sharply defined uh, bone lesions. Also, notice this has a very characteristic V-shaped impaction. And we've just seen multiple images of the mechanism here. And this is very characteristic of a hill sacs lesion and not traction injury when you see this kind of V-shape. The last thing that, that you can see here is posterior impingement and overhead throwers, which, have we talked about that? Yeah, I think we've talked about that, but I think we're going to talk more about that later. Uh, but So those are the three things to think about. The last, the posterior impingement, you only see in overhead uh, athletes, uh, mainly baseball pitchers and catchers and uh, football quarterbacks. You can also see it in tennis players. Uh, but it's so it's therefore relatively rare unless you deal with that that patient population. Uh, 
Hail sacs lesions are fairly commonly seen in the general population, but we see the traction injuries all the time. So that's a typical hill sacs and what it looks like when it's acute. And when it's uh, chronic, you see the same findings here, the V-shaped impaction, but you don't see the edema associated with it. So here's another acute hill sacs in the coronal plane. Uh, and this is uh, another, uh, here's another injury. This was in an airplane crash uh, survivor. And here we can see, uh, at, oh, now the, the other thing where MR can, can play a role uh, is in a case like this. So, so this was an 18 year old who was in a uh, airplane crash in Brazil. The CT images are, are not great, but they couldn't relocate this patient. So he came in, they attempted multiple times to relocate the patient, but they couldn't. So another reason to do imaging is to try to figure out what structure is keeping them from relocating the patient. And here we can see uh, further CT scans in this individual. We can see a lot of uh, kind of bone injury here. Uh, here's the MR examination. Uh, let's see. Max, what do you think is going on here? Well, we have a cortical disruption or basic trabecular injury on the lateral. Uh, as, well, there is the linear fracture, transverse fracture, and also cortical disruption um, and uh, bone marrow edema. Um, but the is, hold on a second. Uh, this looks like a three-part fracture, um, but not not displaced. Yeah, it's not displaced at this time, but, but this really looks like it's going all the way across. So I certainly would be concerned if we go back to the, to the, uh, oh, sorry, the CT. I really don't see fracture fragments here. I think this is really all trabecular bone injury because we really didn't see that fracture well on the CT scan. And we don't see multiple, though there's, there's certainly something going on along here, uh, which is the reason why they got the MR. Uh, here we can see that there is a lot of bone injury along here, and this is probably a near complete fracture. Uh, but at this point, we really don't see it as a fracture line on the CT scan. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And then uh, the humeral head seemed to be in relation with the glenoid, so it's not dislocated on this. Well, actually, it's more anterior subluxed. Yeah. Um, so, so it's still it's not as dislocated as before, but it's still not properly located. Uh, against the glenoid. And there is uh, some low signal intensity in so, between the... So what's this? So is that a displaced uh, posterior labrum or uh, let's see, an inferior glenohumeral ligament or a tendon that could have been displaced? Uh, what do you think? Mm. Oops. How about the bicep tendon? Oh yeah, bicep tendon, yeah. Oh, John, you're cheating. <laughs> okay. And so if we have, uh, here's a, another coronal image which actually shows this is the biceps uh, insertion right up here on the superior glenoid, and this is the biceps tendon coming mm. down here uh, right in the joint space. Mm. And as John was referring to, uh, they couldn't relocate this patient because of a dislocated biceps tendon in the joint space. John, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, one of the things you never, ever want to do is force try to relocate a uh, shoulder. If it's not going to go... Uh, in uh, without uh, uh, anesthetic, then you may give somebody a little sedation and try, but you don't do not uh, in any event uh, force it. Um, obviously, they waited to get an MRI, um, and that that's uh, being as using safe precaution. The problem with waiting uh, and having a subluxation is circulatory problems. So you, it's kind of, um, you got to be very careful that you check the pulses and so on uh, if you're going to wait. Uh, and of course, if the MRI is available within an hour or so, then that's fine. But in this case, um, what you would do is probably uh, open a shoulder and or arthroscope the shoulder um, and, and take care of it that way. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? It's a 30-year-old male uh, with pain and clicking on abduction to 90 degrees after surgical reconstruction for dislocation. And uh, we have axial 
images. It looks like a T1. And it uh, looks like, first of all, transposed uh, abduction, abducted position of pain. Mm. So it looks like uh, on the intermedial aspect of the humeral head, uh, there's a cortical defect. And Talk about this? Uh, this yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, so that when I see when I see defect there, that makes me think of a reverse hill sac deformity, um, and or yeah. okay. So and then looking at the other axial there, uh, I see some marrow edema of the posterior glenoid as well, and it looks like it, I think we have a, a an osseous bankart injury, uh, a reverse osseous bankart injury of the uh, Posterior glenoid. Um, oh, hello? Did I lose some uh, or? I think this is an Abreview, and I think this is posterior, and this is anterior. So okay. what we have here so, is a hill sac. So uh, uh, this is from Australia, so everything's upside down. So, uh, oh. so I think what we're dealing with here is a impaction injury. And, and what we're seeing here now is that that's the hill sac's impaction injury. And when we put it in the position where the patient's symptomatic, that, uh, that impaction injury is actually engaging with the glenoid, something we talked about a little bit earlier. And this is an, an engaging uh, hill sac's lesion. And this is one if it's okay. is a problem, they can either stop putting their arm in that position or uh, do some of John's surgical techniques uh, to placate down the soft tissues here to keep them from being able to put their arm in that position. Okay. So. Or, or doing the allograph. Sometimes you have to do that. Okay. Uh, let's see. What are we going here? So uh, now we'll talk a little bit about the glenoid labrum. We know it's a fibrous tissue. Let's see if we can go in here. So. Uh, uh, Jonah, what do you think is going on here? 53-year-old with uh, evaluation for possible labral tear. Okay, so we've got a um, single axial image, um, and you know I'm seeing some signal abnormality uh, around the uh, labrum, but I'm not seeing, you know, yeah, kind of there. Okay, so this is um, on 8-20-2012. We can see okay. the signal in through here. And maybe some abnormal signal going into the substance of the labrum itself. Yeah, so substance, non-displaced kind of stuff. And throwing a lot of abnormal signal in through here, going all the way to the top. Definitely okay. Yeah. So let's let's go back again, and mm -hmm. see this. Now you always have to be concerned if you see a little black structure like this of the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And these are low field images, so the contrast isn't great. Uh, this certainly looks like it's a tear at the base of the labrum. There. Uh, okay, so we have a tear here then, I think. Okay, now, so that's, now if we follow up on a higher field study, uh, and this is now a couple of months later using an arthrogram, uh, let's go through this again. And here we start down below, whoops. Start down below. We can also see that there's an abnormal signal in the articular cartilage here, and we can look going up. The labrum doesn't look so bad here. We've probably a little loose body posteriorly here. Mm -hmm. There, there it looks like there's probably a tear. Yeah, there's some tear there. Humeral ligament. And so uh, this was uh, labeled tears, uh, kind of without using a PD fat set and with uh, our uh, arthrogram, which just shows that we can see the abnormalities often better, the details uh, with arthrography. But in my experience, and, and I think a lot of others, it rarely changes the actual diagnosis, though sometimes you can describe the lesion better. But I'm not always, I'm not convinced that our better ability to view uh, the lesion on arthrography is it really impacts much the, the decision for arthroscopy. But still, typically, the, the algorithm that we use here at RADNET is if the patient is under 35 and is an athlete and there's a concern of labral tear, we do arthrography. But in people over the age of 35, 
uh, I don't like doing arthrography. I think it's unnecessarily invasive, and I don't think it actually adds uh, useful information very much of the time that changes the clinical management. Okay. Can I just ask a quick question about that last case? Sure. Why did it look like the tear was less extensive on the arthrogram than on the non-arthrogram? It looked like you could see more tearing on the first uh, study done in so August. You can see a little bit here, a little bit on the arthrogram. Here, it looks like there's an abnormal signal here. This is a PD fat set image on the left. This is a T1 fat set image on the right. So we probably have some degenerative disease within the labrum. Uh, which we're not going to see on your arthrogram study. And here again, and this is also a low field study on the left. Uh, and here we can see some increased signal intensity. This actually, this is a, I think a screw sequence on the left and a PD fat set on the right. I, I, I cannot hear you, John. Okay, so this is a low field stir image on the left and a T1 fat set image on the right post contrast. What we're seeing is increased signal intensity within the labrum here because it's a stir sequence, and we're not going to see that on the T1 fat set post. But as far as the actual tear, we can actually see the, the tear a little bit better here on the, uh, on the arthrogram image, though it is certainly abnormal here, and I would call this a tear on the, the regular study. You can actually see the details of the morphology of the tear better on the arthrogram sequence. And if we go up a little bit higher, again, we can see the details of the tear better on the sequence on the right than the low-field stir sequence on the left. Okay, okay so we have axial uh, images after an arthrogram. It's a T1 and a PD fat set. And there's a bone marrow edema and a wedge-shaped defect involving the posterior lateral humeral head. And then more inferiorly, there's a stripping of the labrum with dislocation, and the periosteum looks or periosteum looks thickened there. And the uh, morphology of the glenoid is abnormal too. Um, so can't tell for sure. But uh, yeah, so the patient had an anterior dislocation uh, and had the heel sex injury and a Baker lesion. And here's a patient who had recent anterior dislocation, and here we can see an acute heel sac impaction injury, blunting of the anterior labrum. You'd have to look up and back and forth, but this was a tear. You know, you'd have to be concerned about whether you just have a congenitally small labrum, but here we can see if we go one cut further down, we can still see the acute heel sac impaction injury, and here we can see the displaced uh, anterior labral tear uh, in this location. So, uh, okay. All right, so here's another case. Next. So we got focal edema of the posterior lateral uh, humeral head, which is probably a hill sex injury. Uh, then we're looking at the labrum, and I see some blunting uh, of the anterior labrum. Do you have any other se series? Okay, so. Um, so this one is. So he came back uh, two months later, and this is what it looked like. So now there's some further blunting and thickening in the region of the labrum, and there's we're a little too, high too far, too high. Okay. The well, let's just see the well-formed hill sacs to form. Yeah, sure. So, so what we see here is this is an acute phase of the hill sacs lesion. This is the chronic phase after the bone edema has healed, and you can see the characteristic V-shaped figure here. The lack of bone marrow edema. Uh, is because it's a chronic lesion at this point. Yeah, the, 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 the bone is uh, getting absorbed. Is that 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 bone there? Yeah, um, I would think uh, that that's how you create that V-shape. Yeah. Well, I think I it was think. impacted. I think it was a hill sac impaction injury. Right. Or, and we can see that the cortex is actually impacted here, but we have all this marrow edema adjacent to it, which lets us know it's an acute lesion at this point. And then now it's healed two months later, and it's chronic, and we still see that kind of V-shape where the impaction occurred. 
and then the axial images show some blunting and abnormal signal intensity within the anterior labrum, though we don't actually see a discrete displaced tear. Jeff, what do you think of this one? All right, a uh, 68-year-old male of shoulder pain, weakness, and uh, I guess decreased range of motion for two months. And uh, so we have the uh, uh, coronal PD, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah this so T1, T1 and T2. Uh, T1 and T2. Okay. And uh, so it looks like... This is a PD fat set. Oh, PD fat set, thank you. Uh, so it looks like on the, uh, certainly if you see the uh, large defect, it looks like in the uh, posterior lateral humor head, uh, and uh, definitely we see edema uh, in this area here. So there's probably a you know subacute uh, hill sac deformity. Oh, it's probably um, it's probably acute. Acute, acute, uh, an acute uh, hill sac deformity. Uh, there's what's this? See, what else can we say in this? So I'm looking there, and uh, it looks like in, in the superior labrum, um, I see fluid extending uh, through, completely through the superior labrum, man. Well, you think this is the labrum? Well, no, no. Actually, that is that's the cartilage. That's the uh, wait. Yeah. Well, oh no, actually, it's uh, <laughs> no, it's marrow signal. So actually, it's a, it's the glenoid, it's the pure glenoid itself. Uh, so, so this is, is fat, uh, right? So this is intraarticular fat, right? Intraarticular fat. Okay. So it's right on the T1. It's yes, it's the that's fat set. Okay, here's the yes. articular cartilage of the glenoid. There's the articular cartilage of the humeral head. Oh, so we have a. Okay, so we have a. Okay, ah. Uh, so this is a, yeah, so essentially a fragment. Um, okay. And I think, okay, so most probably the donor site is the hill sex is from the uh, posterior lateral humeral head. Uh, so, so here and, we can see an injury to the anterior inferior glenoid. There's the yes. hill sac infection injury. We've got some other bone injuries that are acute as well. Uh, here's that yeah. fat that's uh, suppressed with the fat suppression. And this was the patient had a hill sac infection injury, but then the some of the marrow fat exuded through the fracture site into the joint space. And so uh, the, it's important to look at all your sequences, not to call this a large displaced superior labral tear with a tear of the of the uh, biceps anchor, this is actually just intraarticular fat uh, coming from the hill sac lesion. So, is I'm wondering what that's like is in in, a, in surgery. Is uh, is that like a soft uh, I don't know toothpaste kind of material, or is that or is that uh, is no, that uh, uh, like a or I don't know how to describe it, but oh, fat is uh, it looks like fat at surgery. Um, it's just floating around in there, in, in the space. It's occupying uh, empty spaces. Okay. So there are no empty spaces in the body except in the bowel. So uh, whenever you see empty spaces, and on T1 uh, image, you see a white area that's fat. And if you see it on a fat sat, it's black. So yes. You know that that's not a fibrous tissue. Or, or anything else, it's uh, pretty, pretty much uh, fat. So uh, when you do surgery, uh, you probably don't even see it uh, when you put a scope in there or whatever you're going to do. I see. Now, so is, is this is something only you seen acutely then? Or, or it would, would it resorb over time? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. This, this patient had a pretty significant uh, force to produce this uh, at this age of 68. It's interesting that he didn't fracture anything. Uh, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've never seen this outside of the acute injury. So okay. uh, my guess is it does get resorbed. Okay. Uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Oh, oh. 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 sorry. Uh, Mr. it? Jonah. Okay, that's uh, sorry. Um, all right, so uh, we've got this 24-year-old uh, with an anterior dislocation. Um, got an axial image here, and you know, on the uh, image on the left, I'm seeing some sort of uh, well-defined curvilinear uh, irregularity anteriorly on the glenoid uh, there. Maybe a little 
blunting of the labrum too. Uh, and then, of course, on the uh, other image, we're seeing uh, some bone marrow edema of the humeral head, hill sacs deformity, going with the um, anterior dislocation. Uh, well, and what do you see anteriorly here? Okay, so looks like we could have uh, ligamentous or labral uh, okay, there too. The labrum. We already mm -hmm. said that there's probably a labral tear anterior inferiorly, but what is this other structure anterior to the labrum? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Do you see the cursor? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, sorry. There's a slight lag, but yeah, I see this uh, kind of irregular uh, structure with um, multiple kind of circulations uh, coming out of it. Um, so. It's one of the ligaments. So, uh, so, so th this is the capsule, and this uh, okay. is the capsule or tear anteriorly okay. from the dislocation. Yeah. And if oh, we go to the okay. ABRA view on this person, here's a case where you can actually see the tear uh, much better on the ABRA view. Uh, and and also see the, it looks like. there's some uh, there's a deformity of the anterior aspect of the glenoid, so we we also have a fracture of the anterior glenoid which we can see. So this is a uh, band cart lesion of the anterior glenoid. So this is a ba basically a fracture and a labral tear. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll talk. Okay. So 38 year old male, three months after sports injury, I'm axial T1 and PD fat set images. There's a, a remote uh, fracture of the uh, posterior lateral humeral head um, and then the anterior uh, aspect of the glenoid has low signal intensity on T1 and you know, kind of variable to high signal intensity on the T2 um, which may relate to a more acute injury um, of the bone um, and then more inferiorly you see um, deformity of the anterior glenoid the labrum is displaced and torn um, yeah. Okay. So, so, so this. Uh, how about the glenoid? So the glenoid has uh, an old fracture involving its anterior infer aspect. Yeah, the old fracture of the humeral head, but the glenoid. Well, yeah. So it's low on T one and high on the PD fat set. So it's a acute subacute fracture. Um, with a labral injury and looks like it's displaced labral tear. And, and we actually have a loose body here in the joint space as well. So this is a, bo a bony bank card, and this is a patient who had re re recurrent anterior dislocations, and this is probably due to old ones because we don't see a bone edema, but the uh, Bancart lesion here of the anterior glenoid is probably acute because we see a lot of bone marrow edema uh, and a lot of low signal intensity on the T1 weighted image, as well as the bony defect here. And on another cut, we can actually see the fracture line a little bit better here, and it goes through the articular cartilage as well. And uh, here you can actually see where the fracture line is, and this part of the bone is displaced, and uh, Here's that dis that displaced uh, uh, bony fragment here on the coronal images anteriorly, and when you when you uh, evaluate these bony bank cards, uh, what's important is to determine uh, what percentage of the AP diameter of the glenoid uh, is involved with the fracture, and the most studies say between 20 and 25 percent of involvement by the bank card lesion. Uh, leads to uh, significant instability and uh, makes it a surgical lesion. If it's less than 20%, then you may attempt to treat the patient conservatively at the beginning. Uh, John, do you want to comment? If it's acute in a 38-year-old, I'd probably wait it out. Uh, but if it's acute in a 20-year-old, I would really think about doing something more. Okay. And, and and put the bone back and, and put a little screw in there. Okay. Uh, so um, it, it all depends on the situation. Well, one thing about uh, any joint, 
is uh, especially the shoulder. Anything that disrupts um, the uh, continuity of uh, um, activity of the shoulder in terms of a torn um, ligament or a torn uh, tendon or a, or a fracture of the labrum or whatever, um, other things go apart. So um, it's, a, it's a very tricky situation. Um, once you have a defect in one spot, you'll probably get defects in other spots if you wait long enough. It all depends on the situation, but um, everything has to work in sync, otherwise that doesn't work very well. I just had a question regarding the percentage. Is it the um, percentage of the surface area of the glenoid or the per percentage of the AP damage? Surface area. Well, it depends upon which papers you look at. Uh, certainly the surface area is, is very important and you can really see that very well. In fact, I like to do the measurements on the oblique sagittal. Uh, but a lot of the papers in the literature use the uh, percentage of the AP diameter of the, of the glenoid. Uh, to, to determine, and it's shown that over 25% of involvement uh, patients tend to be very symptomatic with instability of the AP diameter. Of the AP diameter. Now what about the circumference if you're using the uh, If you lose more than 25%, uh, you're, you're not going to have a stable shoulder. Uh, this shoulder right here doesn't look like it's going to be stable. Okay. It's just uh, without measuring, I, I, I just can see that it's not going to. Right. It's probably subluxed many times in the past. Yeah, I think you have a chronic Hill Sachs yeah. in the acute Bancart. Okay. 14 year old baseball pitcher, pain after a throwing injury. Oh, we got a, a corona, an axial. Uh, is that proton density? Yeah, proton density images. PD fast cell, yeah. PD fast cell, yeah. Uh, we have. Some edema in the humeral head, posterior lateral, or actually, is this more anterior? It seemed to be more anterior. Oh, this is posterior. This posterior, okay, posterior lateral. And, um, but we've done a bony defect, um, and that's about it. And then some edema in the joint space, and some thickening. Yeah, we see the uh, details of the anterior structures very well here. Here's the next cut down. So we have some uh, blunting and globular shape appearance of the anterior, anterior labrum. Yeah, so it's clear here, but what is labrum and what's the middle glenohumeral ligament here? Right. So uh, we see a lot of the edema there by the next cut. We're now one cut further down. Well, I'm not sure if I can separate the middle glenohumeral ligament from a displaced fractured to labrum. So that's the middle glenohumeral ligament, the and then that little Bulb this, this thing. Oh, okay, so it's not fractured. It doesn't look injured there. And then this is the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament mm -hmm. coming up there. So if you go back again here, see this. Uh, uh, this I can't hear you very well, John. Thank you, John. Uh, so what we see here, we have a hill sacks impaction injury back here some other bone injuries as, as well. But we have indistinctness visualization of the anterior superior structures uh, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, joint space. And so in this area, you have to be concerned about the capsule and the uh, middle glenohumeral ligament. And as we know here, the superior glenohumeral ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, and labrum all come together in this location. If we now start going inferiorly, what we can see here is uh, uh, this looks like a small labrum here, but maybe it's displaced. We'll have to see. Uh, it's just a bulbous structure here, but this looks like an abnormal middle glenohumeral ligament here. But also remember the other thing that can come up in this area is the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament as well, which we've already talked about. And if we follow this more inferiorly, what we find is uh, here's this, this is a tear of the middle glenohumeral ligament. Here the labrum looks pretty good. We have a bulbous structure here. Maybe it's part of the middle glenohumeral ligament, but this uh, also I'd be very concerned that this could be an anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament coming up, which may also be injured. And when we followed this down earlier, we found that this went right into the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So if we follow it down here, that's an increased signal intensity within the anterior band. 
Here we're coming down there. That's the middle glenohumeral ligament, anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament labrum, and then this is the an anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament here coming down there. So uh, this then, it looks like the labrum is pretty much intact, but we have a uh, tear of the middle glenohumeral ligament and an injury to the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And uh, here we go here. We can see that this is kind of a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament on the sagittal. And, uh, and we have uh, injuries to, uh, to those ligaments, whereas the, but the labrum is intact. So um, we also have injuries to these structures and not the labrum uh, when you have an anterior dislocation. John? Okay. Injuries are extremely common. They, they may be more common than uh, labral injuries, I don't know. Yeah, but you have to look for them, otherwise it's easy to miss those. Yeah, well, the problem with the capsules is that you can't see the capsule. All you can see are the ligaments. Yeah. And the ligaments, uh, the anterior capsule ligaments, are very adjacent to each other. It's like a fan, and, and so uh, you, you, pretty much, you, you may look uh, and see uh, a ligament going all the way up and down, and it's uh, all the three ligaments together because uh, they're adjacent, uh -huh. Good. Al almost united. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't we stop here, and we'll pick up the saga again tomorrow. Any questions? I like that saga. Uh, <laughs> Just a quick question on this study case here. Uh, so you're saying then that the uh, superior insertion of the, the anterior band of the IGHL is actually sprained in this case as well? Yes, let's go back again. So here, the, is that, the, the this is the uh, anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament right in this location. And you can see there's increased signal intensity within it. Okay. We can also see right. the thickening of the, uh, of the middle glenohumeral ligament in this area where it's been injured. And if we go back up here, here this shows injury to the middle glenohumeral ligament and we're seeing a little bit of increased signal intensity within that anterior band. So it's screwed a little bit. There's more of an injury to the middle glenohumeral ligament. But and the capsule. And if the capsule. You, or, or, well, actually, it's both because yeah. the, uh, all the ligament is is a um, thickening of a capsule. Right. Uh, yep. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Talk to you tomorrow, John. Okay. Okay, so uh, how is our uh, mom doing? Okay. Uh, well, uh, better today, but but we'll see. It's still an ongoing saga with Melinda and her mother, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, give my regards, to Melinda. Yeah. So I just had a question regarding the rotator interval. So say you didn't have an arthrogram with the fluid distending the rotator interval, and you just had, like, say you had a a patient who had anterior shoulder dislocation and you couldn't really see the ligaments very well, um, but you saw but you saw some edema and replacement of the fat signal intensity of the rotator interval. Do you suggest sprain of the ligaments or just don't say anything at all? No, I would only suggest uh, sprain of the ligaments if you actually see the abnormal signal intensity within the ligaments. Okay. Uh, seeing the lack of fat in the rotator cuff interval is more a sign of chronic inflammation uh, within the shoulder, which is really is a different uh, disease. Uh, and like, what if it was edema? What if you saw edema there? The main thing is that the, the shoulder is located in, where it belongs in the glenoid of the humeral head, and you don't see any defects in the head of the humerus, no fractures any place. And uh, so if you see something that's in a normal position, all you do is put a patient in a sling. Um, nowadays they say that you should mobilize the patient early. I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. I think two or three uh, weeks of immobilization is the way I would do it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so bas basically don't call a ligament sprain unless you see abnormality of the ligament itself. And you don't always have ligaments that, that you can deal with. I mean, uh, not everybody has ligaments. Okay, yep. All right.